So Arate Hidalgo, is, uh, she was born in the Basque Country in Bilbao in Spain. Um, she works as an editor and science fiction writer and researcher. Um, she studied literature and medieval um, studies at Bilbao, between Bilbao and Leeds, and began her career as a, in the coffee industry, as she tells me. Um, later on, she moved on to work as an editor in, publish in arts publishing in London, and then afterwards she decided to uh, go independent and focus on science fiction translation and editing. Um, today, she works as an associate uh, editor at Aqueduct um, Publishing and is an independent translator, acting as a liaison between Spanish and English feminist science fiction um, that is written by authors in demographies that aren't normally represented. Uh, Lama was right. I'm all of those things. Um, to be honest, today here I'm more... Um, I, I don't think I, okay, I, I come here as a fan. Um, I'm a fan of science fiction and uh, mostly I just want to take you uh, on a journey through my discovery of the many shapes that uh, gender can take uh, within, science, uh, within science fiction. Uh, I guess <laughs> I was trying to think of ways to like link gender with all of the really interesting stuff that uh, we've been listening to today. I think the main thing, the main point for me is that uh, because, because of where I'm from and because of what I've consumed, uh, I'm going to be talking about gender and uh, departing from the gender binary as defined by like the West and Western Christendom and that, I guess. Uh, that is a gender binary understood as a like a, a power structure that has been imposed around the world. Uh, it, the gender binary as such is uh, is patriarchal, it's colonial, and it divides humans into categories of being according to uh, mostly the reproductive value. Um, so I'm going to be mostly looking at Western products of sci-fi that may or may not depart from that and that make comments on that like, understanding of gender. And by queerness, I hope that we can all agree that it's this umbrella term for all of those sexualities and uh, gender identities that are not the norm. And so maybe we can make like make more comments about it later on. Anyway, I wanted to start with something that's not science fiction. This is so my presentation is all images. There's like no text anywhere. Um, so I'm going to like I didn't even bother like putting the names of the people in the pictures. So like later on, if you want to know or like how to spell the things, I can maybe pass you the presentation and, and like do my homework and actually write the names. Um, sorry about that. But anyway, uh, this is a, a, a montage, a photographic montage uh, of Claude Cahan's uh, uh, portrait. I don't know if any of you is aware uh, who this person was. Uh, Claude Cahan was a French Jewish. Okay, I'm gonna say all of the things. French Jewish uh, lesbian uh, uh, Nazi fighter, among, among other things and mostly is realist artist and who was born in the late uh, 18th century and was uh, mostly known for her surrealist writing at the time. She was a, a really quite foundational member of surrealism. Um, she was friends with André Breton and all of that gang, but uh, eventually she disappeared with her partner who you know, uh, quite uh, spectacularly, was also her uh, stepsister. Um, but they met before their parents did, so she had dibs on it, so it's <laughs> fun. Um, anyway, uh, eventually, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I mean, she's fascinating. I'm going to keep it short, because otherwise we'll just not move on from this. Uh, this picture is called What Do You Want From Me? And this is at the stage at which she had embraced uh, kind of gender neutrality. She was extremely knowledgeable of what was going on in terms of like Western sexo like, uh, sexual science. As uh, some of you might know, uh, Berlin in the 1920s, 1930s was like a 
collection of non-heteronormative identities, uh, which the uh, Nazi regime basically like burned to the ground, literally. Um, most of the people involved there were sent to camps or committed suicide, and it has taken us about 70 years to get uh, to a point of like, uh, you know, a similar kind of like discourse. Um, she disappeared in history. She was rediscovered in the 90s, and basically all of the stuff that I'm telling you uh, is because uh, her partner, who uh, also took uh, a gender-neutral um, name, Marcel Moore, and they were doing them, uh, they were making them pictures that they took of, uh, of Claude uh, posing as different, basically different genders, different characters, fairy tale characters, uh, strong men from like the circus, all sorts of stuff. And, um, and this is the only portrait of uh, her that was uh, published at the time while she was alive, like that it was the way it was published. And at the time, she has this anti-memoir in which she wrote, masculine, feminine, it depends on the situation. Neutral is the only gender that always suits me. And with the, the erasing of like all of the sexual markers, like she was kind of uh, basically expressing an idea of humanity that uh, has like modern, like contemporary commentators have uh, kind of like played with and wondered, does the does its gender necessary for humanity, or does how does gender define humanity, and so on? And for like many different projects around the world, the gendered uh, human and where the 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 line between male and female lies is where the difference between whose life is livable and which isn't, which is like the basis of. Uh, but Judith Butler's uh, work, which I'm not going to talk about because, um, yeah. Anyway, as I said, this is like a really personal trip through my discovery of like gender queerness and gender fluidity. Um, so we're going to thank Claude and move on. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, he, I mean, he's amazing. And um, I think that it was my first experience of seeing uh, we're talking here like really like basic notions of like I was given as like what women should look like, what men should look like, obviously, right? And uh, David Bowie was wearing like these really fabulous glam hair and makeup. And as a, you know, when this movie came out, I wasn't aware that glam was a thing. So like at the time, like obviously this was quite, I guess, commonplace in pop culture. But it, for me, it was really fascinating. And then on the left, we have Loki, well, you know, like a 19th century uh, drawing of the, Nor the, the Norse kind of god, more like a trickster figure, who was uh, mostly vilified and like become an evil figure with the arrival of Christendom. And um, while originally, this, he's kind of like the reason why I did medieval studies afterwards. I'm just not going to focus on him too much. But he, um, he has some of you might know he could take any shape he he liked and that will be seen later in, in science fiction but the fact that he could turn into women for instance like he could become a woman he could become even like a man uh you know uh kind of sparked lots of uh suspicion from others cuz like this fluidity is often seen as uh you know Sneaky and like not you know not not very trustworthy. Um, so growing up and being a teenager and becoming aware of uh, comic books beyond, uh, well like really stale Spanish stuff. Um, this is from the Sandman comics by Neil Gaiman. He's a huge fan of the whole Norse mythology as well. But anyway, in the Sandman, it's ten ten volume. Uh, mm, mythologies from like around different like cultures around the world kind of like collide and then there's like all these et eternals like eternal figures like humanoid representations of different things that supposedly every human being goes through like death and and delirium whatever this is desire desire is the only of the eternal who can take also can be a man a woman both neither and again it's just quite sneaky and quite Fluid and is also is always interested in like their own 
like pleasure and their own gain. Uh, on the right, we have Gabriel, which is uh, Archangel, uh, the Arch Archangel Gabriel, as represented by Tilda Swinton, who of course uh, tends to do roles that involve some kind of gender ambiguity. Uh, in this case, well, in the comic series, actually, uh, Gabriel is a guy, but for some reason in the movie, they decided to give the part to Tilda Swinton, who, of course, uh, was also... Uh, uh, she also starred in the movie adaptation of Regina Woolf's Orlando um, novel. I'm trying to open this, like, like acting all natural, but it's not really working. <laughs> um, yeah, so these were like my, my first experiences of like non super masculine, super feminine like characters and they, they always, I, I was always extremely attracted to them and I couldn't figure out why. It, like maybe 20, well not that much, I'm not that old, but like maybe 15 years later I, <laughs> I, I realized that like now there are attempts for it, like gender fluid and gender queer and stuff, but I'm actually not sure if, well at the end we'll get to them, but uh, what the beauty of science fiction is that you can have aliens, you don't actually have to use theory. So that's <laughs> eventually, that we'll get there, I promise. Okay, this is Ed. This was uh, the first, I think, like per se, I think the first character I came across, even though the term is never used. There's this anime series from the 90s called Cowboy Bebop, in which the entire solar system has been colonized by humans. Um, and basically, it's about some bounty hunters. Uh, it's in this like very 90s uh, internet. Uh, they publish uh, the faces and of the people that are being sought and how much that you're gonna get. And basically, it's like free for all. Everybody goes and gets the person. And um, there's two guys who live in this uh, in this spaceship. And then they, uh, in one of the the first episodes, they come across Ed, who is a hacker, uh, like a really really good. <laughs> Hacker and uh, she introduces herself as Edward, and later on we find out that her father doesn't even remember whether he has a, like a boy or a girl, and everybody like calls her she uh, like the series. I'm pretty sure in the Japanese as well, but um, she doesn't care. Like her, she gave herself the name Edward, and she just like goes around the world speaking about herself in third person. And so she doesn't actually like care that much about what other people might impose. However, the internet is like all over, like making sure that we all know that she's a girl. Like there are so many forums. Uh, there are people like definitely a girl, this and that, analyzing this episode, this sentence that someone said that like proves that she was a girl. But it's like she doesn't actually care at all, which is really great because, yeah. Anyway, you know. <laughs> so now we go into like, like actual, like very deliberate discussion. So there is some text. Uh, this, uh, this is the left hand of darkness. I hope that at least some of you are aware of it. No? Yes? Please, hands. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Ursula Le Guin is considered to be the... Uh, the, one of the foundational feminist science fiction writers. Uh, she's still alive and she says really cool stuff at her like 90. I, don't, I, I can't remember how old she is. She, she's, still, uh, she's still really active online and she has, she is a great example of feminism that analyzes itself, revi like revises itself and moves on and like takes mistakes into account and kind of, you know, keeps developing. But The Left Hand of Darkness, which came out in, 19, in 1969, is about a planet uh, called Winter, uh, where the inhabitants um, basically uh, are a sext. So they have no sex, like sexual attributes, except for uh, four or so days a month, when they choose, uh, unconsciously or not, depending on their sexual partner. Now it it it's such a it's such a discussed, analyzed, read, anthologized like research book 
that there are all sorts of readings of it out there. Some people have considered it proto-trans text. Some other people have, uh, they deem it quite, uh, not transphobic, but definitely, you know, like obviously not very educated. I mean, we're talking about second wave feminism, you know, so it, it wasn't like trans awareness wasn't uh, at its peak um, among, say, like white middle class feminists. Um, but um, basically, the thing about this planet is that we are being told about it from the point of view of a human, a human man. Um, and so he cannot read, I mean, he cannot talk about gender neutral identity because he lacks the language and we kind of do now as well. So he calls everybody he. Um, and that, I guess that like, you know, something to kind of think about in terms of like, you know, the external perception of us. Anyway, we can talk more about that later. Um, Woman on the Edge of Time is another classic of feminist sci-fi. Uh, in this case, it uh, talks about Consuelo. She's a, uh, a Chicana woman who is interned in a mental institution in the US after having fought her, I think, brother-in-law because he was trying to force her sister to, to abort like in some terrible way. So uh, what happens is that she starts having visions and we are never told whether these like visions are real or not, but basically she comes in contact with Luciente, who is a person from a future utopia in which one of the, um, one of the, one of the forms in which uh, this egalitarian utopia has been kind of realized is that everybody is uh, referred to with the pronoun per, which comes from person. And so uh, Consuelo isn't aware of this, uh, of losing this gender at the beginning, but because, again, because of, you know, her, I guess, being grounded in the uh, 1970s US, eventually she just kind of like ascribes a specific binary, like a specific like side of the gender binary to the person according to like what she thinks they look like. Um, so Luciente, for instance, is she and her for Consuelo all the way through. Um, I think that something interesting to point out about this is that uh, basically um, the, this utopia is happening at the same time as a huge, like a, a, a ter terribly dystopian uh, world is kind of like attacking them. This utopia is a little like heaven of like peace and like anarchism, um, while uh, off planet there's this huge station where, among other things, women, uh, let's assume like cis women, or cis cisgender women, are being like basically uh, maybe forced by culture to like uh, uh, undergo really really dramatic um, surgery in order to like. Uh, exaggerate their f feminine traits, and that, like at the time, of course, was extremely dystopian. I'm not sure where we're at with that right now. Um, moving on, this, by the way, is not a chronological. It, it's not. It's chronological according to like when I read them, not when they came out. <laughs> really, bloody, <laughs> bloody, yeah, okay. Okay, oh my God. I'm gonna talk about Octavia Butler because she's awesome. Um, uh, Octavia Butler talks a lot. Uh, Octavia Butler was at the time the science fiction writer, the first uh, black uh, woman to have uh, success writing science fiction. And she was also the first writer to uh, introduce black women as heroes uh, in science fiction. And one of the, I mean, as, as Everybody who's read Octavia Butler knows basically like it, it's all about making sacrifices and surviving given like extremely poor conditions like that you always have to choose between bad and worse um, because precisely uh, you know um, basically they she 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 talks about experiences that have they might have not occurred to like white writers at the same time but basically. Uh, one of her most uh, mm, famous 
works is the Xenogenesis trilogy in which a gene trading alien race has uh, uh, rescued humans from a nuclear disaster on Earth and they are trying to uh, create other beings with them having sex uh, through a third, I'm gonna say sex because gender is too complicated, to a third alien sex called Uroi without which the humans cannot breathe anymore. So that's. <laughs> Uh, Samuel Delaney, I mean, there, there could be confer entire conferences about him, but the one thing that I want to say about him is that beyond gender identity, I think something that Samuel Delaney did for me uh, was a cre he, cre he showed uh, categories not always related to sexuality or gender identity, but which challenge completely the concept of what is human and the, and the limits of, of, the human, of, of the human mind. Um, he, just read him. I'm so sorry, I can't talk about him <laughs> that much, because he's amazing. Um, yeah, he also, so uh, talking about Orientalism and so on, he wrote a four book series called, well, The Neverian Cycle. This is the first one. He talks a lot about, uh, uh, basically, there's this kind of, uh, kind of pseudo-Mediterranean culture in which, like, it's this, this very intellectual, epic fantasy about a society, how in, uh, at different stages in different places, moving from, from a trading to a money-based economy. And, all of, and, and also uh, the struggle of, like, basically ridding the area of, like, the slave trade. It's pretty, it's pr pretty good. <laughs> it's really good. I'm not gonna talk about Dream Snake, even though I would love to. Uh, the, so we're moving on. This is 2013. It's pretty. It, it's um. It's it's made quite a splash because it's really really high quality space opera, which is kind of like the genre that would include Star Wars, for instance. Sort of. Um, this is quite shocking, funnily enough, because it's talk, It's about a uh, an empire that has well, basically lacks uh, divisions of gender. So everybody uses the pronoun. She, or at least the narrator, the writer, and Lecky has chosen the pronoun she to refer to everybody when talking from the point of view of the main character. And the main character, because has, uh, uh, she has been educated within that culture, has a really, she has trouble dividing, like making up, uh, making out what gender is who when trying to be polite uh, talking in, in a gendered language. Uh, so that's how far, I guess, the, 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 the dismantling of the gender divide has come for like this empire. However, it is an empire, so while in uh, Women on the Edge of Time, we see that the uh, erasing of g the gender binary uh, was kind of an, an, an instrument and also a, uh, a result of reaching equality, we can definitely see a completely exploitative, super terrible, expansive interplanetary empire that is really cool with like uh, no gender division. So I don't know. I guess we can. It, it, it can say things about how arbitrary the division, like how arbitrary the idea of gender <laughs> is, and whether it really is in our. World. I mean, in our world, I guess it is intrinsic to power, like the the, the different ways power relations are. Uh, produced between us and reproduced. Uh, Andrea Hurston is really, really cool. I just I want to talk about everybody forever, but um, Andrea Hurston uh, is writing currently. This is from 2016, and this one uh, actually, it, okay, it's basically about a, a queer uh, teenage girl in the in Philadelphia in the 80s, who comes, who inherits from her deceased brother uh, a, some chronicles written by an alien from a different dimension who has landed in, a, in the 1890s uh, kingdom of uh, Daome, current Benin. Um, and this alien is basically male, female, both and none at the same time, and develops a, what is purely a loving 
uh, relationship of loyalty with a woman warrior who are historically real uh, figures um, called the Ahosi. Um, so check that one out as well. Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> let me let me sum up with this. <laughs> uh, I will pass all the memes really fast, and it will like give this kind of effect of cyberspace. Um, but basically, okay, this is Steven Universe. I could talk about this one for for hours. But basically, this is like the latest that's come out in terms of like. Uh, Gender, gender queerness for children. <laughs> this is in a, it's in a show where like these humanoid shaped gems can merge and t like turn into bigger gems. What happens is that there's this boy who like is super friends with, with his human friend and then they actually manage to merge because it's half gem. Like, you have to watch the whole series to understand. But basically they just, they just merge and they become this, this person uh, called Steboni, which is like a mix of the both names, and nobody cares that they don't have a specific gender, and everybody fancies them. And basically, um, <laughs> this has been a really, really, really quick journey through <laughs> <laughs> through my education, the different ways the science fiction and fiction in general can be used to kind of like explore uh, what is there beyond you know, man and woman, and it, <laughs> I hope that you've had a good time, even though like, I mean, I don't know, have you learned anything? But um, maybe I have learned that I could have used half the slides. Um, but basically, I guess I wanted to say that for me, I, I used to read, I tried to read Butler and I tried to read Donna Haraway and, and I'm sure I will quote them at some point. In, <laughs> But, but it's, for me, it really was like traveling to like, you know, planets and like going through the actual sacrifice and the actual pain of actual people who can shape shift into, you know, like a black woman who can shape shift into a, a white slave owner and, and like, the, like the, the kind of experiences that that gives me as a human being who can relate to stuff more through storytelling than through theory. Like for me, that was the way I came to terms with the possibility that in mid space or so-called like real life beyond the internet, who like I can be something that maybe may yet you know to come. So anyway, <laughs> so that Sailor Moon. I hope that you do you do know this one. But uh, this is from Gender Queer Genga uh, Facebook page, uh, which uh, popularizes queer uh, theory in like really, really short sentences and just the comments next to each meme are like really awesome and you can learn a lot through just like collective meme making.